Okay. Um, hi, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Karim Bugida. I'm the Dean of Universal Libraries at Universal Rhode Island. This is our uh, 23rd meetup, Rhode Island AI meetup. Um, we're lucky today and we're really um, happy to have distinguished host, uh, sorry, guest, Julia uh, Stoy Stoyanovich. She's assistant professor at NYU, and she's really kind of did very interesting work on, uh, on AI ethics and res responsible AI. And um, you can, I mean, you can ask your question in the chat or, uh, or wait until the end. It's like just few of us, so it's gonna be kind of very interactive uh, at the end. So um, welcome again. And um, if you have a question or concerns, or let me know through the chat, okay? So uh, Julia, it's yours. Thank you very much, Karim. And since we are such a small group, I'm totally fine with you all to uh, just speak up and interrupt me if you have questions throughout as well. Um, so let me share my screen. And you're seeing my screen, right? Okay, yes. Good. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Julia Stojanovic, and I'm an assistant professor of computer science and engineering, and also of data science at New York University. Uh, and I direct the newly established Center for Responsible AI at NYU. Today, I will be discussing the challenges of designing, developing, and deploying data intensive systems responsibly. I'm speaking here specifically to technologists such as myself, or primarily to technologists such as myself who tackle these challenges as part of their day-to-day -day work or studies. And I will be treating these challenges through the powerful lens of equity. So what is equity? Equity is a social concept, treating people differently depending on their endowments and needs to provide equality of outcome rather than equality of treatment, lends a unifying vision for much ongoing work to operationalize ethical considerations across technology, law, and society. And today I will present a vision for building systems that consider equity as an essential objective. So this is my interpretation of data equity systems. So to start, we need to agree on one thing, and that is that AI is great. It's the best thing after sliced bread, literally. The convergence of unprecedented data collection capabilities, enormous computational power, and broad acceptance of data collection and analysis as part of our everyday lives, really, is offering us tremendous opportunities to do good. We can accelerate science in a variety of areas, from astrophysics to medicine. We can boost innovation from self-driving cars to advertisement targeting and back. And perhaps most importantly, or very importantly, we can improve society by improving how governments function, by helping make resource distribution more equitable, and by bringing greater transparency and accountability to government operations. Perhaps most importantly, we can get AI to do all of our work on our behalf so we can just kick back and relax at the beach. So to motivate uh, the work on data equity systems specifically, I'd like for us to spend a few minutes thinking about the use of data-driven algorithmic systems in hiring. I'm calling these automated hiring systems. A recent report from Upturn describes the hiring process as a series of decisions that form a funnel depicted here. It's a social, legal, technical system that is operationalized as a sequence of data-driven algorithm assisted steps in which a series of decisions leads to job offers to some candidates and rejections to others. The process starts when employers source candidates with the help of ads or job postings. Next, during the screening stage, employers assess candidates by analyzing their experience, skills, and characteristics. Through interviewing applicants, employers continue their assessment more directly. 
then they may perform some background checks and then uh, finally an offer will go out to the successful candidates and importantly during all of these steps of the funnel people and machines interact in some way as stated by jenny yang who was the commissioner of the u.s equal employment opportunity commission or eoc under obama automated hiring systems act as modern gatekeepers to economic opportunity. So why are these systems so attractive? First, they help employers, large and small, to hire more efficiently, to source and screen candidates faster and with less paperwork, and to select candidates who will likely do well on the job. These tools are also meant to improve efficiency for the job seekers allowing them to apply with a click of a button, matching them with relevant positions and facilitating the interview process. And we also often hear the argument that the use of these tools can help us improve workforce diversity. So what is that about? An argument is very often being made that because humans are biased, we have no choice but to use machines to step in and hire on our behalf. I'm showing you here an excerpt from a famous study by Marianne Bertrand and Sindil Mulainathan, who back in the analog days of 2004, manipulated perceived gender and race on resumes, and then observed that applicants who were perceived as male and white received significantly more callbacks on the very same resumes, just with the name replaced. So are algorithmic hiring tools living up to their promise? Well, unfortunately, there are some bad news. One of the earliest indications that there's cause for concern came in 2015 with the results of the Ad Fisher study out of Carnegie Mellon. The authors ran an experiment and found that ads for high paying jobs were shown far more frequently to men than to women, all else being equal and literally equal because these were not real men and women, these were synthetic profiles of web users who only differed in their stated gender, which in this experiment was binary, male or female. And this disparity here brings back memories of the time when it was legal to advertise jobs by gender in newspapers. It has been outlawed in the United States in 1964, but is still present in this online ad environment. Another example uh, that I'm sure many of you heard about, it made quite a splash in the press, uh, came in 2018 when it was reported that Amazon's AI recruiting tool, which interestingly was built with the stated goal of increasing workforce diversity, in fact, did the opposite thing. The system taught itself that male candidates were preferable to female candidates, yet again, it penalized resumes that included the word women's, as in women's chess club captain, and it downgraded graduates of two all women's colleges. And the thing that's most interesting to me in this particular example is that Amazon essentially has unlimited resources on their hands. They have unlimited programming expertise, unlimited data, an unlimited amount of money, and yet they were unable to, to crack this uh, work, lack of workforce diversity nut with the help of a purely technical solution, and in fact, potentially made things worse. Other examples uh, of discrimination include shutting out people suffering from mental illness, such as depression or bipolar disorder, on the basis of online personality tests, even if they have the right skills for the job. And this is the last example I'll mention. There are many, many more. Uh, so this one is really striking. It's uh, about showing ads suggestive of a criminal record when Googling for African-American sounding names and doing so far more frequently than when Googling with white sounding names, even when you control for whether the individual whose name you're Googling in fact has a criminal record. And this of course is problematic generally, but also in the context of employment. Uh, in employment, this may be an issue because employers may Google for an applicant's name as part of a background check. And then seeing an ad that is suggestive of a criminal record will bias them against that individual, even if they don't click on that ad. So to summarize, uh, we are concerned about the use of data-driven algorithmic systems in hiring. Their effects are often discriminatory, discriminatory, reinforcing results of historical disadvantage. And this discrimination is often linked to the term bias. And this is a term that is used 
by the technical community and more broadly, ever more frequently, but that remains poorly understood. I will discuss bias and will give a plausible interpretation or a set of interpretations in a few minutes. So in addition, or perhaps even before worrying about bias, we should ask whether these tools actually work. Are they picking up useful signals from the data or are they an elaborate coin flip at best? As Arvin Narayanan, a computer science professor from Princeton depicted here, puts it, are these tools AI snake oil? If a tool helps improve workforce diversity by some definition, but it admits uh, and it admits a sufficient number of candidates of each required demographic or socioeconomic group. For example, it admits enough, in some sense, women and men, and enough individuals of each uh, ethnic or racial group. But otherwise, its decisions are arbitrary. Can such a tool be considered fair? This is a substantial question that we very often don't even attempt to answer. What if the decisions that the tool makes in the name of enforcing workforce diversity are worse than arbitrary? What if it's picking up signal like a person's disability status and we have no way to know that this is even happening because disability status was not explicitly disclosed on an application, but the system is picking this up through some proxies. What if it's measuring something about a job applicant that we have no reason to believe to be relevant for the job for which they are applying? For example, what if it's picking up a person's first name, like Jared, and saying, because their name is Jared, they will likely do well on the job. And this is an anecdote that also was uh, broadly publicized. People whose name is first name is Jared and who played lacrosse in high school are likely to succeed and therefore are prioritized by these tools. So how can we know whether these tools work? Well, AI tools are engineering artifacts, and we should not take the claim that they work on faith. To know whether they work, we should use the scientific method. Formulate a hypothesis that states in a falsifiable way that the tool indeed selects applicants who will do well on the job. And is better at predicting performance on the job than a random guess would be. What is falsifiability? Just to remind us, in the words of the philosopher of science, Karl Popper, a theory or idea shouldn't be scientific unless it could, in principle, be proven false. Now, in this very complex ecosystem in which automated hiring tools and similar tools that are used in important domains are commissioned, developed, and used, we must ask ourselves who is responsible for ensuring that these tools are built and used appropriately? Who is responsible for catching and mitigating discrimination and due process violations and for controlling the proliferation of snake oil under the fancy label of data science and AI? And while we may be tempted to say that it's the legal department that is responsible or it's this AI ethicist that we just hired that is responsible, unfortunately, things are not quite as simple. And in fact, we all are responsible for making sure that technology is built and used appropriately. And in particular, technologists have uh, a very, very important role to play here. So what specifically is the role of technologists and what is our responsibility? This is something that I hope we will get some sense of uh, as we progress through the conversation. Now, in response to the question about responsibility, uh, we've been seeing attempts to regulate the use of data-driven algorithmic tools, such as those that make part of the hiring funnel. This activity is broader in scope than algorithmic hiring itself. And so let us now step back for a more systematic view and discuss automated hiring systems or ADS. The sorry, automated decision systems, I, I meant to say, or ADS. The hiring funnel, as well as each component of the funnel, are examples of ADS. These systems process data about people, some of which may be sensitive or proprietary, they help make decisions that are consequential to people's lives and livelihoods. They involve a combination of human and automated decision making. They are designed with the stated goals of improving efficiency and promoting, or at least not hindering, equitable access to opportunity. And finally, they are subject to auditing and to public disclosure. ADS may or may not 
use AI, although most of them are billed as AI because AI sells. And they may or may not have autonomy. Usually they make their decisions together with a human, but they do all rely heavily on data. So how might we go about regulating ADS? And should we even attempt to? This is the subject of intense debate uh, throughout the world, uh, and certainly in the United States also as of late. And I've uh, had an opportunity to witness some of this debate firsthand, and I'm happy to share some of that experience with you beyond what I'll say in the talk also during the Q&A if that's of interest. So how might we go about regulating ADS? And should we even try? The predominant uh, sentiment in the industry is still that regulation will stifle innovation. But thankfully, industry alone doesn't get to decide. And even in the Silicon Valley, the need for meaningful regulation to ease compliance and to limit liability is starting to be more and more broadly recognized. There is much debate on a specific regulatory framework. Should we use precautionary principles that can be summarized as better safe than sorry? This is what we use when we bring drugs to market, for example, medicine. Or more likely attempt a more agile risk-based method, such as algorithmic impact assessment. All this and more is subject of intense debate. And part of this goes on in New York City, where I live. So New York City uh, recently made a very public commitment to opening the black box of the city's government's use of technology. In May 2018, an automated decision systems task force was convened, the first such in the United States. And it was charged with providing recommendations to New York City's agencies about becoming transparent and accountable in their use of ADS. And I was a member of the task force, and I'm actually going to pause here and just uh, let you all stare at this picture and see if you recognize anybody else. And I realize that you don't live in New York City, but the, the person at the bottom right, for example, can you tell who that is? No. No. So uh, this is Maya Wiley. She is one of the mayoral candidates. She's actually one of the front runners. Uh, so she was on the task force and then there is a person uh so the person kind of over maya is solon barocas i don't know if you know him he's quite prominent in this space as well he's a researcher at cornell uh and to the left of solon uh is janet wing she is the director of the columbia data science institute so these are the folks that that you you might know <laughs> um right so so the task force uh issued its report uh, in November 2019, making recommendations that automated decision systems should be used only where they are beneficial, not because we bought them and we have them. That is not reason enough to use them. They, we actually need to show that they help with something. Uh, also, we should use them in a way that promotes fairness, equity, um, accountability, and transparency. And we should reduce the potential harm across their lifespan. And the first point here, uh, reinforces the no to AI snake oil sentiment. So while making important points, the report in the report, the task force unfortunately didn't go very far in terms of concrete recommendations. And I'm happy to comment on how that all went uh, if there's interest during the Q&A. Uh, but we may have an immediate opportunity once again to make things more concrete, concrete in New York City. So at this point, I want to bring to your attention a proposal for a law that we're currently entertaining uh, in the city that would regulate the use of automated employment decision tools. If passed, this law will apply to the use of these tools both in government and in industry, and it will prohibit the sale of such tools if they were not the subject of an audit for bias. The law would also require to disclose to candidates when such tools are used to assess their candidacy for employment, and also to tell them what job qualifications or characteristics were used by the tool in the screening. So this proposal is being discussed still. We don't yet know whether it will pass, uh, but there's quite a bit of excitement uh, around this proposed bill because it would actually be the first very, very strong regulation anywhere in the world, as far as we know, 
that would allow us job seekers, and we all look for jobs at some point in our lives, uh, to know that we are being subjected to these systems and to understand what information these systems are using about us to make decisions. So now, uh, with some of that background, with the motivation, with the algorithmic hiring tools, and also with a regulatory uh, requirement that may be coming, possibly in New York already this year, but if not, then certainly this, this space is moving very fast, and we expect to see regulation uh, of algorithmic hiring tools and more broadly, uh, we now need to figure out how we might accommodate such requirements. And generally, getting back to technologists, we need to understand what role technical solutions can play. So for this, we need to step back and think carefully about what technology can and cannot do. What can we do with the help of data and model debiasing, for example, that you may have heard about? to support the responsible use of ADS. This discussion is necessary to help us find a pragmatic middle ground between two harmful extremes depicted here on the left and on the right. On the left, I'm showing techno-optimism, and that is a belief that technology can single-handedly fix deep-seated societal problems like structural discrimination and hiring. And on the right is the other harmful extreme, and that is techno-bashing a belief that any attempt to operationalize ethics or legal compliance in ADS will amount to fear washing and so should be dismissed outright. So our job is to find the nuanced middle ground here. And to help us figure out how to do this, let us now recall uh, a taxonomy that was proposed by Batya Friedman uh, and Helen Nissenbaum in their seminal 1996 paper that's called Bias in Computer Systems. In that paper, Friedman and Nissenbaum identified three types of bias that can arise in computer systems, represented here as a three-headed dragon, with heads saying pre-existing, technical, and emergent. Pre-existing bias exists independently of an algorithm itself and has its origins in society. Technical bias is introduced by the operation of the technical system, and it may exacerbate pre-existing bias. Finally, emergent bias arises in the context of use, and it may be present if a system was designed with different users in mind, or when societal concepts shift over time. We will fight the three-headed dragon of bias with the help of a data equity knight. So this knight here, it has three swords, one for each head, roughly speaking. Data equity has three major facets. The first is representation equity. It refers to the deviations between the data record and the world that the data is meant to represent, often with respect to historically disadvantaged groups. Access equity is concerned with having access to information features, data, and models that are needed to evaluate and mitigate inequity. And finally, outcome equity refers to the downstream unanticipated consequences that are outside the direct control of the system. And I will now go through each of these data equity types to give you the flavor of some of the technical positioning that we can achieve. And as will become clear, purely technical solutions will never be sufficient. They will have to be based on explicitly stated values and beliefs that in turn arise through public conversation and societal consensus. So let's start with representation equity. When I think about representation, I like to think about data as an image of the world. It's mirror reflection. And then when we think about whether this data represents the world correctly, faithfully, we interrogate this reflection. One interpretation of bias in the data is that the reflection is distorted. We may systematically oversample or undersample particular parts of the world or otherwise distort the readings. And it's important to keep in mind that the reflection, of course, cannot know whether it's distorted. 
That is, data alone cannot tell us whether it's a distorted reflection of a perfect world, a perfect reflection of a distorted world, or if these distortions compound. The assumed or externally verified nature of these distortions has to be explicitly stated. Another interpretation of bias in the data is that even if we were able to reflect the world perfectly in the data, it would still be a reflection of the world such as it is today, and not necessarily of how it could or should be. And importantly, again, it's not up to data or algorithms, but rather up to people, individuals, groups, and society at large, to come to consensus about whether the world is how it should be, or if it needs to be changed, improved, and if so, how we should go about improving it. And my final point here is that changing the reflection does not necessarily change the world. If the reflection itself is used to make important decisions, for example, whom to hire or what salary to offer to an individual being hired, then compensating for the distortions is worthwhile. But the mirror metaphor only takes us so far. We usually have to work much harder, going far beyond technical interventions like debiasing, to propagate the changes back into the world, not just brush up the reflection that is the data. So let me now give an example of a concrete approach, technical approach, that focuses on representation equity in set selection and ranking. And these tasks, selecting a set of candidates or selecting and then ranking some top candidates is something that we encounter day to day in many, many decision uh, processes, including also in hiring. Another example is college admissions, right, that, that we all are very familiar with. So consider now the task of selecting four candidates among 16 job applicants. And here our goals are twofold. The first is diversity. We wish to include two candidates of each gender and at least one of each race. Our second goal is utility, which I'm going to quantify here as maximizing the sum of scores of the selected candidates subject to diversity constraints. You can see a list of candidates here in the table, along with their scores. For example, candidate A has score 99, L has score 83, and the higher score is better. And you will observe that in my example, male candidates have higher scores than do female candidates of the same race, and whites have higher scores than blacks and than Asians. The highest scoring set of four candidates that satisfy the diversity constraint is highlighted here in pink with a combined score that happens to be 373. If we consider the set more closely though, we observe a problem. And that specifically is that we picked the best according to score white and male candidates, A and B, but we did not pick the best black, Asian or female candidates. And note that my example was deliberately constructed to highlight the following. If some population groups have systematically lower scores, then it costs less to skip their best scoring members in the name of diversity. And this runs contrary to the nature of the diversity objective, which is to equalize access to opportunity. And this also represents unfairness under a particular belief system. Suppose that scores represent effort, for example, how hard someone had to study to do well on a test. We may take a relative view of effort and assert that scores are more informative within a group than they are across groups. And further, we may assert that it's important to reward effort, that you should have a better chance of success if you study harder. Now, taken together, these beliefs correspond to a lack egalitarian conception of equality of opportunity, denoted here with a rainbow unicorn. There is something we can do, though. Consider the set of four candidates in blue. This set still meets the diversity constraints. I have two of each gender and at least one of each race. And its score is just slightly lower than the score of the optimal utility, optimal pink set. The blue set contains the top scoring candidates of both genders and the top white and black candidates. And so it's much better in terms of rewarding effort across groups than if we simply were blindly maximizing utility. Now, having stated our beliefs and observed the trade-off between diversity, utility, and fairness, we are ready to design an intervention. And I already explained to you roughly what this intervention looks like. But for example, we may compute unfairness for each group, like the female candidates, as the ratio of the score of the lowest scoring selected candidate. Here it's K with score 83, 
and the highest scoring skipped candidate, that's D with score 95. And this ratio represents a regret for that group. Uh, and now we can reformulate the selection process to balance unfairness across groups. We did this on quite a bit more in a paper that I'm citing here, defining uh, several fairness metrics of this sort for both set selection that I just described and also for ranking. And then we devised the way to actually execute under these constraints with the help of an integer linear program. And of course, I won't go into any details here, but the reason I'm showing you this is to say that there's actually a way to make a connection between the values and beliefs that we state and the technical intervention that is explicitly based on these values and beliefs. And then when you do that, you can go ahead and publish your paper in a technical conference, right? This doesn't have to remain the sort of soft and just deliberatory kind of uh, research. So now moving on uh, to the second of three kinds of equity that I defined, and this is access equity now. Access equity is concerned with having access to information, features, data, and models that are needed to evaluate and mitigate inequity. The point of view that I take here is primarily of mitigating technical bias, and that is making sure that we're able to catch and correct the imperfections and distortions in the data as it travels through complex data science pipeline. Much exciting work goes on now on supporting access equity, both in terms of implementations and in forming a conceptual understanding about the interactions between pre-existing and technical bias and their impacts on equity. The fair machine learning community considers this work out of scope. Their focus is on predictive analytics that take as input a nice clean rectangular data set, they crunch it, and then they produce a result. And then if we notice that the result is such that no women are shown ads for high paying jobs and no black candidates are invited for job interviews, then we have three choices. We can tweak the input data, for example, upsample or downsample some groups. We can tweak the algorithmic box, for example, add a regularization term, or we can tweak a result, for example, reassign some outcomes. And this is a useful exercise, but it's a limited view. I'm showing it here as a uh, task of fighting a paper dragon, which may be useful during, during training, but it's not going to really help you fight the real uh, dragon of bias. For that, we need to expand our scope and start asking what specifically happens inside the box, how results are used, and where the data came from. In other words, we need to take a life cycle view of equity. And this is something that is, again, squarely within the purview of the technical community and in particular of the data management community to which I belong. Um, and here I'm going to give an example, again, at a very, very high level of uh, where technical bi bias arises and where we need to think carefully about how to catch and mitigate it. For this, we will consider Anne, a data scientist in a human resources department at a large retailer. Anne is tasked with developing a model that predicts the level of compensation to offer to successful job applicants to make sure that they are in fact hired, that they find these offers attractive. Anne is going to include self-reported demographic data together with employment histories as input. Following her company's best practices, she will start by splitting her data set into training, validation, and test. She will then implement data pre-processing, join some tables, and then interpolate missing values. This is because for us to be able to make predictions based on the data, we have to have a value for every attribute filled in. Classifiers or any other kind of a predictive analytic is not going to be robust to missing values. And after this, Ad will perform model selection, finally tuning and validation, and then she will observe uh, a problem. And this is a kind of a fairness problem that she will encounter, namely that accuracy, being able to predict what salary to offer to somebody is going to be lower for female applicants than for male applicants. And this presents yet another kind of a fairness issue. This is not fairness of outcomes, but it's fairness in terms of uh, disparities and accuracy of prediction. Now, considering the complexity of this data science pipeline, Anne has a long night of debugging ahead of her. So thankfully, uh, she has a hunch. She goes back to the data pre-processing step and observes that the value of the attribute age 
is missing far more frequently for female applicants than for male applicants. And you know, knowing what we know about the world, we of course can believe this to be the case, right? Women uh, don't love to disclose their age. And especially as we get older, we don't disclose our age. And this, by the way, is gonna be true also across genders in the context of employment, because as we know, there is age discrimination in employment, right? So the older people get, the less likely they will be to disclose their age. And this will be particularly true of women. So what Anne would do based on this hunch is she will compare age distributions by gender and she will notice differences starting from the mid thirties. She will revisit her data cleaning step and will select some state of the art data imputation method to fill in the age in, cust in uh, applicants demographics. And this will help. So imputing age in a way that is better that incorporates some knowledge about the world is going to help Anne achieve higher accuracy and parity in accuracy across these demographic groups. Now, this example can be generalized. Consider a form that gives a job applicant a binary choice of gender, but it also allows to leave gender unspecified. And suppose that about half of the users identify as men and half as women, but that women are more likely to omit gender, perhaps also for fear of discrimination. Then if we impute using the default method, which is replacing a missing value with the most frequent value for the feature, then all predominantly female unspecified gender values will be set to male. So using this method, you will skew your data systematically to be more male. And if you believe my previous example, you'd skew it to be younger. More generally, uh, multi-class classification, more than two values for missing value imputation, typically only uses the most frequent class as the target variable. And this is going to lead to a distortion to, for small population groups. If you are a member of a small group, you're gonna be distributed among large groups. And this also introduces a skew, a bias in the data. Now, suppose some individuals identify as non-binary. Because our system only supports male and female and unspecified as options for input, then these individuals will likely leave gender unspecified. And now, once again, if mode imputation is used, then their gender will be set to male. And a more sophisticated imputation method will still not help because ultimately it's going to only be filling in with values that are from the predominant classes. These are some examples that are common that we don't think about. We just take the defaults when we develop our data science pipelines that, that can introduce skew in the data. And importantly, it has been documented that data quality issues like missingness disproportionately affect members of historically disadvantaged groups. And so we risk compounding technical bias due to data representation with pre-existing bias for such groups. I'm going to skip the next couple of slides. They just talk about some tools that uh, we developed, that I developed together with my colleagues and very talented students that allow data scientists to debug uh, the data that they have for any new introduced uh, distortions, and also to run scientific experimentation in these very complex pipelines in which we have multiple objectives to meet, and yet we need to be able to answer the question convincingly to ourselves and to others about whether the systems that we're building actually work. So now let me switch uh, and spend the next couple of minutes uh, discussing outcome equity, and then we will go to Q&A. So what is outcome equity? It is concerned with whether and how we can assess in and mitigate inequities that are outside the system's direct control. My thinking about outcome equity centers around interpretability and public disclosure. I like to think about interpretability using the nutritional label metaphor. To differentiate a nutritional label from more general forms of metadata, and of course we all know and love metadata, but this is a special kind of it, I want to argue, uh, we can articulate several properties. Nutritional labels should be comprehensible, understandable. They shouldn't be complete and therefore over overwhelming in explaining everything about the data, the computational process and the result. The information on a label should be simple, short and clear. A label should be consultative, providing actionable information, not just descriptive metadata. Based on this information, a consumer may cancel unused credit cards to improve their credit score. 
and the job applicant may take a certification exam to improve their chances of being hired. Labels should be comparable, enabling comparisons between related products and implying a standard, therefore. And finally, they should be composable and computable, derived automatically as data and decisions are produced and manipulated and travel through these very complex multi-step systems. And of course, this thinking about nutritional labels uh, is timely and in part it's motivated by what the New York City bill uh, would require if in fact it's passed with this requirement for public disclosure. Now, bridging the social aspects of interpretability, uh, I'm working with a, a couple of colleagues in social psychology at NYU on a framework that forms connections between interpretability and trust and develops actionable explanations for a diversity of stakeholders, recognizing their unique perspectives and needs. An important point is that individuals and groups who distrust algorithms may be less likely to harness the potential benefits of new technology. And in this sense, interpretability intimately relates to equity. Recent studies found that individuals who are more familiar with AI fear it less and are more optimistic about its potential impacts. As part of supporting outcome equity, I'm also passionate about educating technical students about responsible data science. I developed and have been teaching courses on this topic at New York University. The course I'm showcasing here just finished its third run, uh, and it has been able to attract an amazingly diverse and engaged group of students. All course materials are publicly available online. I'm showing you here this photo because I think that it says more than a thousand words because it's very difficult for us, as you know, to attract a diverse group of students into STEM topics. And this is an advanced technical course. I will also note uh, that we've been developing a data responsibly comic book series. Its first volume has been translated into Spanish and French. And the second volume uh, was released recently and we're working on translations as well. Uh, this uh, project and all the graphics that you saw in, the, in my talk today are due to the amazingly talented Fala Arif Khan, who is a brilliant computer scientist and a brilliant artist, as, as you can see. Another set of activities is on developing public education materials and methodologies. I'm showing here a course that is currently being run for the first time, actually, it's starting this Wednesday, today, um, at the Queen's Public Library, called We Are AI. And we have also been developing a We Are AI comic book series that is designed to be accessible for non-technical readers. And it accompanies the public education course that we just released. The first three volumes are out at the link below. The remaining two are on the way and will be released within the next two weeks. Now, wrapping up, in my talk, I gave a perspective on the responsible design, development and use, and also oversight as part of use of automated decision systems. I grounded the discussion in automated hiring tools, a specific use case that gives us ample opportunity to appreciate the potential benefits of data science and AI, but also to get a sense of the ethical and legal risks. And it's clear to me that we technologists have an important role to play, but to make progress, we have to step outside our engineering comfort zone and start reasoning in terms of values and beliefs. In addition to checking results against known ground truths and optimizing for efficiency objectives. This seems high risk, but one of the upsides is that it's gonna be easier to explain to our children what we do and why it matters. And on a related note, an important thread that runs through my thinking and through our discussion today is that we cannot fully automate responsibility. While some of the duties of carrying out the task of, say, legal compliance can in principle be assigned to an algorithm, the accountability for the decisions made by an algorithmic system always rests with the person. This person may be a decision maker or a regulator, a business leader or a software developer, or importantly, a member of the public. And for this reason, I see the role of technologists such as myself in helping build systems that expose the knobs of responsibility to people. And of course, the systems that we're building are not simply technical. 
They are social, legal, technical. In some sense, technology is the easy part. And this means that to expose the knobs of responsibility to people, we must work together to create meaningful regulatory mechanisms, a topic on which I touched briefly today. And I also see it as part of our responsibility as technologists and as educators to help create a new generation of AI practitioners and an informed public. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Julia. Amazing graphics. Aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that your artist Falah is, is amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for, for uh, giving us really this thorough kind of definition of biases and kind of how technically you approach them. Uh, I'm not going to start asking questions. I will let first the audience if you have question and otherwise I'll ask the question myself. So you can unmute yourself. So we're just 12 of us. So please go ahead if you have a, if you have a question or a comment. I have a question. Yeah. Joan, Joan Peckham here. Um, yes. Wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so happy to see that are, there are people working on this issue or problem. Um, Thank you. My question is, you know, um, do you, are you aware of any groups who are actively working with um, lawmakers to, um, you know, pass laws that require oversight and the use of these tools or people who are actively working with, you know, large industries who create, you know, create these, you know, AI tools to assure that they're proceeding in, in the right direction with attention to this? Yeah, uh, thank you for this question. There, there are lots of people who, uh, who are working on this, lots of people, lots of organizations. Uh, there was, at the federal level, there was a, a number of initiatives uh, under President Obama. Then during Trump, we didn't see very much happening, but now uh, we're hopeful that, that in this new administration, things will start to move at the federal level again. But in the last uh, four or so years, again, because of the federal climate, most activities were happening at the local level. So either in cities or in states and in New York City in particular, where I've been active in, in this area, there, there, there have been several attempts uh, of you know, varying uh, degrees of success, one might say, or even failure. But we at least we have been trying to figure out how to negotiate this very, very, very complex space where technology is easy. The hard part is people and incentives and figuring out you know, how you can create an environment, a kind of a safe space where a person who works at a government agency comes and is open with you about how they use algorithms and actually asks for your help while not being afraid of being put on the spot and landing on the front page of the New York Times, which is the horror of their you know, <laughs> this is how careers end, basically. So yeah, it, it's, it's very difficult. There are lots of efforts uh, at every level. Um, not as many computer scientists are trying to get into the conversation because it's just really hard uh, to get anywhere productive, I feel like. Uh, although it seems like it's easier for us technical people to talk to policymakers because the stuff they do is written in English, at least, right? We can read it and understand it potentially. The stuff we do is math and code. Uh, and so it's easier for us to cross. But still, cultures are so vastly different that, that it's, it's a struggle. But we can't give up. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thanks. So, so you have, Julia, you have hope in terms of like long term, like if I compare to European Union recently, like four weeks ago, they come up with those uh, regulation and basically Silicon Valley freaked out and said, no, 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 we don't want this, these regulations. So how do you think that this the macroeconomic model of the US versus Europe and the rest of the world? You know, I'm, I'm of course not an economist. Okay. Uh, and to, to the question of uh, whether I have hope I'm an engineer, right? So I, I think that the, really the only way for us to get to a better world is to kind of help make it better. And right now I feel like public pressure is where we need to, uh, where we need to focus. And this is why I've been working on 
a public education course and on comics that are for members of the public because i think that ultimately people speak uh users of the systems or people who disengage from systems they are the ones that speak regulation is only one of the tools in the toolkit and even the work that goes on in the eu which is far ahead right compared to us in terms of their thinking and regulatory approaches that also is still at the very high level right i mean uh things haven't really been tested in court very much gdpr wise even and it's gonna take time to really instantiate the provisions of the ai uh transparency regulation so it's it's all going to be ultimately up to us and a lot of it is going to be up to public pressure and of course we expect the silicon valley to freak out right that's that's part of the game here we'll see we don't know but we, we can't just be bystanders here i think we need to help create a conversation okay anyone I have another question. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, so you're an engineer and I'm a computer scientist. And you know, I've been engaged in reviewing papers and so on and proposals from you know an interdisciplinary community. I mean, you know, working with data scientists and so on, you, you get involved with that. But it seems to me, and maybe it's just my own prejudice, that engineers and computer scientists are absolutely the worst when it comes to thinking about these things. And, you know, is there something that we can do as educators or, you know, as engineers and computer scientists to assure that, um, you know, maybe it'll be hard for that to change in the current generation, but maybe the next generation coming up will be more savvy <laughs> with regard yeah. so so maybe the first thing to say is I'm a computer scientist as well, right? I just think that computer science is an engineering profession. Okay. All right. Uh, but yeah, my degree is in computer science. I publish in computer science venues. I'm in uh, data management, as, as I mentioned. So that's my home community. Mm -hmm. um, I, I absolutely agree with you, Joan, that, that we need to uh, start educating our students and also then, of course, they go into the industry, right? And they become the next generation of practitioners. Uh, about the fact that technology is so successful now that we can no longer pretend like the things that we can do with technology are all objective and the ground truth. And that also makes it more exciting. Um, so I've been teaching these courses, I flipped to the slide just now. Uh, I've been teaching courses called Responsible Data Science. And as far as I know, I mean, I think a few people teach similar courses now perhaps. Uh, but uh, when I was starting, there wasn't another course like this. Folks teach privacy maybe to graduate students, like advanced PhD students. Uh, and there, there was a course on fairness in machine learning that was also for a very advanced audience. But we lack offerings uh, to undergraduate students of courses that are technical, that are not just, you know, you come in, you fall asleep, you wake up at the end of the semester because none of it really draws you in. Um, so technical courses, but that don't come at the very end and that are not like this philosophy or ethics elective, right? So th this is what, what I've been trying to design and I'd love your opinion on uh, whether you think that any of these course materials are useful to incorporate in some of the sophomore or junior level courses at your institution. I'd be more than happy to help. This past semester, as I was teaching, I taught an undergrad and a graduate course um, in parallel. And I was working with uh, a data science professor from Ramapo College in New Jersey, who mm -hmm. was also concurrently teaching to her master's students the same material. And mm -hmm. so we already have this experiment of actually starting to scale up and, and uh, you know, see what's, what translates and what doesn't to another environment. And as another thing I'll say is that uh, not only do I get the most diverse groups of students in this course, much more so than in my data management and algorithms courses that I've taught, in the past, incomparably more diverse. But my students are also a lot more engaged. So people actually do really care about this material. They're really excited. They, I'm, I was so proud of them when they did their final projects. I asked them to create a nutritional label uh, for an ADS of their choice. So they went to Kaggle, they found a competition that was interesting to them. And then they analyzed, are the requirements appropriate? Is the data set appropriate? How does the, the ADS work? Is it fair? Is it stable? Would I recommend using it in practice? What improvements would I recommend? 
the types of analysis that they did, I was absolutely amazed. And every team of students came up with this really coherent, thoughtful, uh, you know, end-to-end -end kind of an analysis. So I'd be very happy if they remembered what they learned and then used it in, in their next software development job that they undertake. So yeah, well, we have an edge here and we really need to start teaching them, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. This generation of students is different from an earlier generation. We've um, been teaching a social issues and computing course to the computer science majors for a while. And, uh, you know, I taught it for about a decade. And when I first started teaching it, they were sort of like, you know, we just write the programs. We have nothing to do with this, you know. And, but the, you know, the last few classes, the students were very engaged understood that this was a highly important topic. And what, right. what we need to do at URI now is to create one for data science majors that's, fo you know, that's focused on uh, the machine learning and, and analysis. So, um, and at our regional meeting recently in Rhode Island, we um, decided that maybe we would work together across the institutions in the region to create a common course that we created together on on this topic so i think we should look at your materials <laughs> and, and uh, please, uh, please be questions. in touch yeah please yeah. be in touch I'd, I'd be more than happy to uh to share the materials to share the homeworks but also to co-design something with you we also Thank had you. the paper that just came out in uh that speaks specifically about the methodology uh for this responsible data science course how to find this balance between something hands-on uh and and also something more thoughtful yeah you might hear from me again <laughs> yes would be delighted to <laughs> thank you yeah thanks julia and um and john any last question otherwise i'll ask one oh we have uh, uh okay more of a comment thanks jeff and karen my last question for Julia, uh, if I remember correctly, the Amazon HR flaw, one of the reasons was right. the historical data where they right. kind of, because they were not hiring women, so there was some inferences. How would you approach that, like if you were in charge? Right, so uh, exactly what is implicated in that example specifically is that they relied on historical resume data. Uh, and if you take historical data, it only includes uh, performance resumes and performance of people who were hired and who did well on the job. It doesn't include information about how somebody would have done had they been hired, right? Yes. So in a sense, if you rely on the data that, that only consists of the positive examples, so to say, even leaving out the whole conversation about what it means for somebody to do well on the job and whether that is objective in some sense, right? Probably not really. Uh, you are already limited by, by that uh, data set. So what I would do is I wouldn't rely on uh, machine learning in hiring because I think that we should be using and we have shown that we can effectively use predictive analytics uh, and, and similar tools in contexts in which we can precisely state what the goal is, where we can really validate whether the thing worked or did not work. And then we can you know, run this machine and have it execute the specification. But if our goal is do what I mean, or get me a person who looks like they'll be a successful applicant or a successful candidate, then that's, that's just voodoo magic, right? I mean, the best you can hope for here is that you will just be replaying the past in the future and somehow legitimizing it by saying the machine said so, right? So I'm actually, you know, if, if you ask me to design an algorithmic hiring tools, I'll tell you first, give me the precise requirements for the job that I can very quickly match like this degree, this skill level. And then once the precise requirements are met, if you still have more applicants who meet the requirements than positions, you should just do sampling, like stratified sampling if you want to enforce diversity constraints or just flip a random coin. And that is not gonna be unfair systematically, right? It's not going to be mm -hmm. picking up some signal that is due to what college somebody went to or what their first name is. And you know, I have to tell you that in conversations with others, uh, 
who like me are technical folks and are working in the hiring domain specifically we all are of the opinion that this this is the most meaningful way to proceed uh is is really just you know precise requirements you meet those requirements beyond that flip coins and you don't need a fancy ai to do that and it's not going to cost you a billion bucks uh to develop and then then you stop the snake oil proliferation right there i agree <laughs> yeah yeah should be in charge <laughs> i think nutritional labels will help us with this that they will actually expose some of these bad actors uh and ultimately companies that's that buy the software from vendors when there is a nutritional label you get when you procure you'll know what you're getting at least you'll know how the thing is validated right now it's all just oh i'm buying an ai tool because everybody else bought an ai tool in my industry right and then the industry feeds on itself that's why we need regulation. And do you have an opinion around within HR of our, around the emotional AI and face cues? Yeah, I think that's yeah. that's just terrible. Oh, I mean, that's race science, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I just don't see what I don't see what useful signal it can bring, and even if it could, it would be unethical to to use. Agreed. Right. Yeah. But then also, you know, that when you try to dismantle uh, a, a kind of a structure like this, at some point you just start arguing on values and beliefs, and you cannot have a logical argument about that. So right. So when when I talk to somebody who is an industrial psychologist, and they say no, there is science in this, and I tell them no, but this is wrong. This is not a way to have a productive conversation. So when we technologists step in, I think we need to be dismantle the the structure based on something that we can show like if we can show that the thing is broken that for example you feed it the same profile in word and in pdf and it gives you a different personality score then you don't even have to engage in that argument about whether personality is something that is worth constructing you can just say it doesn't work it doesn't have validity so the trick is really kind of holding back and finding a, a point where you can uh, deconstruct constructively Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and um, this is it. We enjoyed the Thank conversation. Thank you for having me. And if if we have question, we can I I guess uh, or attend this uh, email you. Correct. That's fine. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Let me put my email here. Sianovich at NYU. And Sianovich. Okay. Cool. We should follow you. Uh, I'm following you in Twitter anyway. <laughs> Great. <Okay. laughs> Thank you very Thanks. much. And um, bye bye, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your bye. day. Bye. Thank you.